My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program on behalf of the Sousa Mendez Foundation. Our foundation honors a rescuer who saved thousands of lives during World War II and paid a very heavy price. And today we're focusing our spotlight on someone else who is saving so many lives all over the world and is certainly paying a very heavy price himself. We are privileged to have the two filmmakers with us today, Jesse Dillon and Priscilla Cohen and they will be in conversation with Dr. Michael Berenbaum, the co-founder of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Dr. Berenbaum will uh, be something of a moderator in addition to being a speaker. So we're gonna start out with Dr. Berenbaum, uh, who's then going to engage our speakers in a dialogue or a trialogue, I guess. So Michael, how are you? Very good, good to be with you and um... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. If you're calling from Australia, a happy tomorrow, and uh, we'll enjoy ourselves. Let's begin with uh, Jesse and Priscilla and really get a different answer from, or the same answer from both of you. Why did you do the film? You know, I, I wanted to, uh, I started working with George uh, many years ago. And, uh, you know, when I first started working with him, I didn't have a very, uh, you know, strong understanding of, of what he was doing. And as I gradually came to understand it, I felt like uh, there was a lot of misinformation out there and I thought we should make a movie of it, you know, and it took a long time to make the movie, but, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was happy to be able to tell the story. And why did it take such a long time? You know, it took a long time because it, it's pieced together from lots of different things. It takes, and, and it, I didn't have a lot of the materials, so... I had to either get them um, by watching uh, different things online to sort of figure out where they were and then organizing the interviews that I needed uh, just took forever. And then I just had to work on it and work on it and work on it. And that, that took quite some time. Priscilla, what answer would you give to the same question? I would say that as we were doing some other work um, around Open Society Foundations and we got to know, first of all, spending some time with Mr. Soros and also beginning to understand that it was a piece of mythology that, that very few people really knew very much about his life, who he was, where he came from, and what is the work that, he's, that, that he and the foundations does. And I, I think we felt it was increasingly important for people to understand and have context um, because there's so much misinformation out in the world about so many things, as we all know. And so this was a story and a person, a human being that has done a lot um, for others. And, and I think we felt morally compelled to try to expose and show what we had learned and what we were learning. My family uh, comes from that part of the world and um, you know how someone reacts to the Holocaust, you know, there's lots of ways that that manifests itself. And, um, you know, in George's case, living through um, the Holocaust and living through, uh, you know, communism in Hungary, you know, his reaction was this um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, idea to give away his, his wealth and help, help others to try and uh, think about the, the, uh, the uh, ends of his, his uh, moral responsibility that he had to others, which I think that, um, you know, if if uh, if the Holocaust is is all evil, then what is what is uh, anti evil? Um, you know, I think that that George and lots of other people explored that kind of idea after the war. When did he leave Hungary? He left Hungary, I think, in uh, after the war. He got out. At, you know, I, I I'm not sure exactly the year, but, uh, but he left after the war. After uh, his friends were killed, and you know, his family. His family was fine, but they had to hide during the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a terrible thing in Hungary, as you know, um, uh, just so many people killed in a short period of time and just having to hide and, and live that life. Um, you know, I let think- me, uh, Let me give a one minute history of the Holocaust in Hungary because it, it's intriguing. Hungary was an ally of Germany 
uh, but it didn't engage in the final solution uh, until Germany invaded Hungary. Germany invaded Hungary in March of 1944. Notice the year 44, after it was known that Germany was going to lose the war and after um, um, it was clear what direction it was taking. Uh, it instituted all of the anti-Semitic legislation and, uh, immediately. And then between the 15th of May and the 8th of July, a period of 54 days, 437,402 Jews were sent primarily to Auschwitz. Eight of 10 of them died upon, were murdered upon arrival. The then the only living Jewish community left was Budapest. And Budapest, the question was whether there would be enough time to kill the Jews and enough resources to kill the Jews. And that's the point at which uh, George Soros's family went into hiding. So you're talking about um, literally running out the clock between the 8th of July and the 18th of January, which is the day that Budapest was liberated by the Soviet Union or was entered by the Soviet Union, liberating it from Nazism, but coming with its own particular agenda. And this was the era in which Raoul Wallenberg one of the great heroes of the Holocaust was the person uh, who began intervene with the Schutzpass, the false document and the like. It's said that we know people by the enemies they make. So let's look and hear at the beginning from the enemies that uh, George Soros has made. The fact that I have become involved in so many different issues and have taken controversial positions has now is now actually working against me your father's considered the boogeyman how does that make you feel well you know he's become demonized in what, by one community because he is synonymous with liberal cause who's funding black lives matter one of the big donors seems to be George Soros, our old pal. This is a George Soros-funded anarchist effort. Those who are stirring it up, many of them work for George Soros's uh, front organizations. That wasn't a spontaneous event. It was organized by far-left groups, which received millions of dollars from the liberal activist George Soros. Do you believe George Soros is behind all of this? I tend to believe it. I believe it fits in his uh, attack mode that he has and how he the world makes more sense if you simply have a single 85-year-old mastermind pulling all the world's strings and doing the things that you fear and dislike. Next call comes from Batavia, Illinois. Uh, yes, Mr. Soros, I was wondering if you would like to apologize to Holocaust survivors that you had exploited and to the American public at large who you have tried to manipulate with your devious and un-American activities. Uh, no, I'm afraid that I can't do that. You can continue accusing me, but until you give some evidence on the basis of which you're uh, basing this, uh, this, uh, these accusations, I can't oblige you. I'm sorry. Last year, I was invited to the Global Anti-Semitism Forum. At the very end of the conversation, we asked for questions. And the first person who stood up said, you have not spoken about why George Soros is a Nazi. Half the audience, several hundred people, got up and applauded her question. Well, look, I, I think as always in these attacks on a, somebody like George, you know, what makes them powerful is there are small fractures or elements of, of truth in which is concocted into something which is completely untrue and false and, and, and shameful. I guess the question to you, Jesse, is why has he made these enemies and does he deserve them? Well, I mean, I, I, I think he, I think it's interesting who the enemies are more than why does he, does he deserve them? You know, his, his goal is that people should be able to uh, express their opinions. You know, he doesn't necessarily agree with their opinions. He's just saying that people should be able to express their opinions in an open society. So the question is, why are people against that? 
Um, and I'm not really sure what the answer is. I think it's a complicated, it's a, it, it's a complicated thing. Um, I think that if you take Viktor Orban, he's against it because he's trying to control Hungary today. Much, uh, you know, probably if he could, similar to the way, uh, you know, they did uh, when, you know, Hungary was before the war, you know, after, during the war. But I, I think the, the, the question is complicated. Does he deserve the enemies? I don't know if anybody deserves the enemies, but I think that, um, you know, he's fighting these battles all over the world and it's, and it, it's hard for people to understand why and, and uh, you know, that, and they need an enemy. So he's as good as any, you know. And Priscilla, what did you learn about what is the irritating, uh, and I'm not using that pejoratively, I'm using it descriptively. What is the irritating quality that um, seems to trigger this much anger at one man? I think so it's interesting. A global yeah. phenomenon. So I think there's a couple of things. Um, one is the areas in which he chooses to support are controversial in and of, of themselves. So for example, um, you know, he, he launched a, a big drug policy project in the United States years before people were thinking about that. And I think what's, what happens is he'll go in and he'll work on, as a philanthropist, areas and issues that most other philanthropists do not want to go near. So it's the Roma all over Europe. I'm sure all of you, you know, know the plight of the Roma. Um, and, and so this is, I think, irritating sometimes. I mean, Tucker Carlson says it in the film. He, he goes into a place and other people might think governments or statesmen or, you know, citizens might say, well, why are you coming in here? You know, who are you to, to kind of come in? And he used the word metal. That was, I think, what, what Carlson said. And I think that that is, that is unsettling to people. I think that it's, that is probably one of the reasons why. And, it's, and I don't think one can say definitively his position is, you know, is, is one way for, for an issue because he is very flexible in his thinking and he's listening to people on the ground. And so he, he, it's, it's a complex world um, and, and it's not black and white, you know, the way that we can work through problems. Um, it's very much in the gray and, and that makes, I think, people uncomfortable. So I think it's a cumulative effect of, um, you know, how and why he pisses people off and why it's, he's become just such a, you know, uh, a lightning rod. You know, I think that his, his caring is rooted in, in Hungary when he was a boy. And I think um, people's reactions to how they felt during the Holocaust were always very different you know, from one another, you know, it's hard for us to have a perspective on what it was to, to be there now. But, you know, you always think about physicians, you know, who are, even in the present day, are, have the doubling, the, the feeling of doubling. You know, they can, they can you know, they're, they're, during the Holocaust, they're, they're uh, killing people. And yet, you know, we see all that footage of people outside, you know, that, that scrapbook that was found at Auschwitz where they're having a party in the evening, you know, so they've compartmentalized these two ideas. I think with George, he he cares all the way about the things that he sees because that's what his reaction was to the Holocaust. And I think that when you see a lot of other people who are super angry at him, they've compartmentalized their caring about a community. He doesn't fund Black Lives Matter, but he does fund people who are trying to build a better life for himself. And he sees himself in that. And he sees himself in the Roma. And he sees himself in the Rohingya. And he sees himself in in any underserved population, and I think it's a direct, um, it's a duck, a, a direct uh, sort of comes straight from what he experienced with his father during the Holocaust. So let's focus on that for, for a moment. Um, one of the startling parts of the film is the fact that he walked in and had a conversation with him, and he seems to uh, go all over the place and meet with a whole range of people and do something that's quite rare for a man of his power, which is to listen first. What's his, think, his, what's his modus operandi? Well, I think, he, I think that uh, in the film, you see him um, up in Harlem when Harlem was a dangerous place and they're expecting 
you know, a lot of people to come and he just rolls up himself by himself and sits down at a table and talks to people. And, I, and, and I've experienced with that, uh, him doing that um, all over the world. And I think that that's part of, um, you know, comes out of Human Rights Watch and these organizations he worked with early was that I think his very first experiences with philanthropy were not great. You know, I think that they went, they just took the money and, you know, he got, he got taken advantage of. So I think that he just got into a habit of going to the places, sitting down with them and listening to them directly and trying to help them, uh, you know, with ideas and money to be able to, uh, you know, make the world a better place. And Priscilla, does he manage these organizations or does he um, support the management and empower them? So he, so yeah, he, the, it, he supports, first of all, there's a whole group, you know, Open Society Foundations, which, which has offices and people around the world, thousands of people that are committed to this, this idea of an open society. I mean, so, and he has always, and as it's grown, as Jesse said, it started with Human Rights Watch and then that first, uh, that person, um, Arya Nair, who's in the film, um, who also I believe his family survived the Holocaust, um, they started to, you know, kind of look around and, and see where the work needed to be or where support needed to be. Early on, of course, uh, you know, there were, there were the big things where he started in South Africa and then in uh, Sarajevo, et cetera. But, you know, it was really about listening people coming to him, he going to other people's sort of word of mouth, we you know of a group or a group is, is feeling, you know, disenfranchised. And so over time, I think he's, it, the organization has grown and he really allows the people that work are with him collectively to, to continue to find and, and what, you know, where's the work, where should we support? He's very, very involved still at 90, he'll be 91, um, but he, as he says in the film, he really trusts the people around him. And, um, and they, what I think is also very interesting that Jesse and I have witnessed um, in, in traveling around the world and sometimes going to sort of large conferences where you will really see him engage question. That, that questioning um, is I think still today one of his most remarkable attributes. It's um, that curiosity about what is it that other people are thinking, really wanting to understand from their perspective, the other? Uh, Adrian, uh, who's in our audience, has asked a very simple, very basic, uh, but very essential uh, question, um, which is, uh, what is the open society? I wanna hear from both of you and then let's hear from uh, George Soros and, and others as to what is the open society and differentiate it, for example, from democracy itself, and maybe even from globalization. Um, you know, open society is the idea that everybody has the opportunity to participate and get their voice heard. And, and uh, when George grew up, he grew up in these very rigid, um, uh, you know, ideologies that, that uh, you know, didn't like Jews. So, what he tried to, what he's tried to focus his time and energy on is helping create societies where there's an interchange and dialogue between the different parts of society. And so any voice that's not heard should be heard in an open society. So, you know, Priscilla, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, and it started with Karl Poplar, which is where he got that, you know, again, post World War II. Um, it's complicated, the, the, an open society is even larger. I, I love the idea of, Everyone asks, and nowadays we're all wondering what is democracy and how do we hold on to it? It's a very fragile thing, but it's even, it's, it's bigger. It's a bigger idea because it allows, you have to allow for difference of opinion. Um, and so it's not really political as more as it's something that goes beyond politics. It's sort of, we have to listen to each other even if we really don't agree with each other. And how are we going to continue to tussle and, and bend and stretch to accommodate, as Jesse said, these more voices, with the idea being in the more voices that are heard, a, a, a richer and a more complex world will have a better, ultimately a better society. Um, but I'd love to sort of see what uh, George let's, and, let's and hear the, George's Let's hear George's vision of it. We'll come back to you, Jesse, in a moment.
trying to improve the world is more difficult than making money. You can only measure it if you have a strategy. I set up a foundation to promote uh, this idea of an open society. Opening up closed societies, making open societies function better, and foster a critical mode of thinking. Combining informed reasoning with an informed understanding of what is needed in the world to change the lives of people. George Soros is a spectacular example of that combination. He's very suspicious of conventional wisdom. So he's a person who likes to argue. He likes to take the counterfactual position. He likes to take the counterintuitive position. He actually thinks for himself, and he's always self-critical. I know that I don't know all the answers. Whatever frame I create is bound to be biased or uh, incomplete or, or distorted. The important thing is to be aware and to try to minimize the damage. He's a giant. He walks very small, careful steps. So people don't hear him going boom, boom, boom. And actually, I think he's quite shy. That intellectual power that he brings, he sees things from a, a very broad systemic perspective. Uh, that's very unusual. People tend to feel that these problems are so huge. Leave it to the governments, leave it to others. But George never has that attitude. George always feels he can make a difference, an individual can make a difference, and doesn't hesitate to try. As long as there are people like George Soros who make it possible for people out there who have a vision of positive change to try to, to create that positive change, we're heading in the right direction. We're asked, we're asked several interesting um, uh, questions. Um, one is, uh, why did George Soros agree to the film and did it take much convincing? Uh, it took a few years, so and uh, I don't know what tipped the balance in him agreeing, but he finally agreed. You know, I I, um, I worked with, for him for a long time. I worked for the Open Society Foundations, not directly for him, but but just telling the stories. And and then after I decided I wanted to make a movie about it, I think it took three or four years before they actually agreed. You know, before okay. George agreed. Priscilla. It was very, yeah, I mean, he was not interested. That was not, I mean, yeah. he's, again, nobody, here we are. Um, and I think I, I mentioned this to you, Michael, that I'd always sort of heard about him before we started working with the Open Society Foundation. I sort of heard the name. I had no idea really who he was. And, and by design, you know, in the film, he, he does talk about being the wholesale guy. Um, his dad was the retail guy, you know, in terms of, and he thinks of his philanthropy that way. He's behind the thing and he doesn't really, I, they say that he's shy. I think that that's true. Doesn't really want to be out there um, as a public figure, ironically, um, but wants the, the, the work to be out there, people to support the work. But so, it, yeah, it was-, it was well, I'm it was, saying for, for a guy who doesn't want to be out there as a public figure, <laughs> he's damn well a, a great failure in the process. <laughs> yeah. uh, he hasn't succeeded about that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm reminded, though, of, um, you, you'll forgive the, the pain in the rear end scholar within me. There is a um, study of, uh, by C. Wright Mills uh, about, um, called the myth of omnipotence and the myth of impotence. And that is that we have a double-edged sword with regard to certain figures and certain institutions. Omnipotence means they're all powerful and impotent means they can't do anything. Um, the idea uh, and the example he uses is that there were, uh, McCarthy said there were 26 communists in the State Department and the State Department led uh, uh, China to let China go communist. The myth of omnipotence is that you had uh, 21,542 very patriotic, very skilled, very competent American diplomats who all failed, but 26 communists were able to get everything done. The myth of, um, uh, of impotence is that if they were that powerful, I wouldn't dare go against them at the same time. There has developed around um, Soros a tremendous myth of omnipotence. 
Could he be involved with all of these institutions? Is he responsible for all of that? Is he funding all of that? Um, no. You know, is, is, is he quite as powerful as his enemies imagine him to be? Uh, is he quite as, as weak as some of his uh, would-be supporters say? Um, I, I don't think that he has power in, you know, he's not trying to, to in his philanthropy, to exercise power. He's trying to, to create a more uh, open society by supporting groups that are trying to do that, but not funding things like Black Lives Matter. He's funding like school lunches and, you know, people getting edu educated, you know, they're, they're, it, it's not a, um, it's not a force like that. So I think that, um, you know, again, you got to look at the forces arrayed, a, 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 you know, aligned against him, because that's really the question is, who are they? And why do they need such an enemy all the time? Because if it wasn't him, it would be somebody else, you know, or something else. And, but and, you know, a lot of times that comes back to the, it, it's a Jew, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that we talk about and hear about George Soros, it's all anti-Semitic tropes that have, have been there for a long time. Well, let's touch, let me uh, share a personal experience. I worked in, I've been working in Eastern Europe since the late 70s. And I worked in Eastern Europe during the time when it had um, developed the struggle for freedom. Then when it became enormously uh, enamored with democracy, and uh, in this period of time, when it's moved from democracy to authoritarian nationalist leadership, Soros has gone from a hero to a villain in this period of time. Um, and uh, I would, would say from the perspective of the governments of Eastern Europe, one could almost say deservedly so, meaning that he has been consistent with their search for the question of what society they want to create has changed dramatically over the last 35 years. Yeah, I would agree with that totally. And, and the question is, how do you move it towards the right, you know, and keep, keep moving it towards the right? And the, the answer is you, you need enemies. You know, you need, you need a George Soros or somebody like that. Now, you mentioned, uh, and I'm reflecting on a couple of people here, you mentioned um, Soros the Jew, and yet your um, film almost scrupulously avoids any discussion of Israel. And uh, Israel also has a question of the open society. And Soros again uh, becomes an atypical Jewish philanthropist because he hasn't... Uh, paid his dues to the typical Jewish philanthropies? Um, well, he, he hasn't paid his dues directly. He, he hasn't publicly paid his dues, but he spent plenty of uh, money in Israel. Um, and I think that he, what he's interested, not that I have talked to him about his Israeli views, because I can't say I have, but I think that he's always interested in the underserved part of the community. And, uh, you know, he, he's... Um, you know, I would say that, you know, he's committed to Israel in the same way we all are, um, uh, you know, as far as I know. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, of, uh, of uh, Jewish people who don't, aren't big fans of his, but I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, he's still, he's still committed to Israel, you know. We've been asked by somebody, um, how would you uh, compare his type of philanthropy on the left with somebody like uh, the late Sheldon Adelson's philanthropy on the right? It's an interesting, tough question. Um, I think that what you're talking about there is whether we think that people should be able to have more of a vote in our democracy, uh, whether, you know, I think we're, we're uncomfortable with very, very wealthy people being able to exert pressure either way. So I'm not sure I have an answer for you about whether one is is better than the other, but they're both exercising that in the same way for different goals. You know, and if you took away a lot of the words and you didn't know who they were, you'd probably find quotes that were very similar about what they're trying to do. I, I found one of the aspects of the film that intrigued me was um, 
he's clear about the power that his money allows and enables, empowers, and develops. Um, he, um, he seems to um, be a little bit surprised by that at the same time. Not surprised, that he, not surprised that he made money, but surprised that he can ha really have this type of impact. You know, I'm not sure if you asked him whether he would think that, you know, you sort of touches on this at the end of the film, whether the things he's tried to do have had an impact or an impact in the way that he thinks they should. You know, if this type of social change was easy, I think it would already be um, accomplished. So I think he spent um, a fortune exploring these ideas but I think that if you would ask him, he would probably say very unclear about whether they've, they've created the things that he wants to, you know, he would like to see in the world, especially now that we see a lot of the gains from World War II uh, reversing as this generation goes. We, we, are, we find ourselves with these authoritarian regimes around the world again. And, um, you know, hopefully that won't continue, you know, because we, you know, I think we know where that ends up. Uh let me ask a, a, a question about philanthropy in a different way. I, I've worked with um, several important philanthropists and um, I've always been um, surprised by those who really demand returns on philanthropic investment. I'm not talking about personal returns, but for example, Michael Bloomberg really, um, when you get a grant from Michael Bloomberg, at the end of it all, you are a better organization because you've worked your, yourself silly to be able to, to give measurables and achievables and um, things you're gonna accomplish. And you've really articulated uh, a direction you're gonna go. It makes lots of organizations uncomfortable, but a hell of a lot of organizations much better. Uh, what is his sense of what you would call return uh, on investment. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about personal, uh, you know, Understand. when you're giving away money, you're not expecting money in return, but you're expecting to achieve something. And again, so, you said his early philanthropy, he didn't regard as particularly successful. What changed about it? I think in the early days, he was just taken advantage of by people who just went and the money just vaporized and disappeared. I think the idea of measurement is a very complicated idea. It's, um, you know, I've worked for quite a few philanthropists and, you know, you, you always hear this idea of measurement and, and, you know, there's a strong place for that. We see it in our world today when we talk about vaccinations, you know, it's like, that's a binary result. You know, it's just everybody got the vaccine or they didn't get the vaccine, right? Well, with um, what I found very unusual about the way George does his philanthropy is that measurement, it's important, but it's not necessarily the most important thing because a lot of the things that you wanna, um, you wanna, uh, you know, you're really concerned with don't have measurement. How do we know whether we've made our democracy better? Now, we see the beginning of those kinds of ideas with the sustainable development goals where we're trying to put measures on that. And some of those, those things we as America are sort of failing on, but, but there's an idea of them. And I think that in a, um, you know, how do you measure whether more art is making a difference in, in your society? You know, one of the only places that you could make things that can change the way people feel about things. So I think that's a complicated question. Um, Priscilla, do you have something to say about that? Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, I, I think that to pick up the Bloomberg example is great. I mean, it's a great counterpoint. It's true. There is very, you want very specific measurement. And again, um, when you're talking about sort of people on, if they're sort of more on the fringe of society, what, you know, how can you measure large, what does change actually look like? And it is, it is a different idea um, because it's cultural, it's attitudes, it's so many things that are, um, that one, you just can't measure. So, um, and I think that that's, also part of the way that he has led in the past as a philanthropist, which is trust the people, you know, make, he'll make a bet, you know, and people I can see are asking about his, his, you know, that genius of a, the, of a moneymaker of the head, you know, of, of the um, investment guy, he will invest in people 
Um, and then he'll, he'll have a hunch and he'll invest in a person um, in a place and, and let them do what they need to do. And so it's really then up to, up to those people that he's you know, taken a, a, a bet on for them to figure out how it all works. And that's a, I think it's a very unusual way uh, to do philanthropy, which we but, don't- but, but ironically, it's some of the very same way that Warren Buffett acquires companies. Which is, um, uh, I mean, if we're talking about the mega wealthy and their ways of doing things, uh, Buffett acquires companies and does so in such a way that it can keep their management and really invests in their management and presumes that they're going to make a good product and, and make him money over the long run. He doesn't run the, um, the, all the companies he acquires. Uh, I think that, that if I heard the film correctly, that's quite a way in which Soros is doing his philanthropy, which means he may not be responsible for everything that's done with what's being done, but he is responsible for empowering the individuals to do what they are allowed to do. Yeah, yeah and I, I yeah, I would say that uh, what comes up a lot um, in the film and in, in the talking with him in the past is sort of the unintended consequences, right? That, that is part of that, where, you know, if you are gonna really do that and you're gonna let go and let people do it, you, you don't always know. You don't always know how things will turn out. You don't know that the work you're doing may unintendedly, you know, create a whole chain of events that, that are kind of counterpoint to what you're trying to do or, and that's, you know, that's where all the complexity really sits in, in my opinion. Let's touch on some of the questions that have been asked by our, our, um, our audience. Um, uh, Shula Reinhardt, um, uh, who's a, a very distinguished scholar in her own right, um, says, can you explain how the film was funded and what did George Soros himself think of it? Um, you know, I know that George, you know, basically, um, you know, I paid for the film with investors. George had nothing to do with it. And, uh, George has seen the film, and uh, I wouldn't say that he liked it, but he, you know, he, uh, I think he, I think he was, I think he was satisfied with it. Is probably a good way to put it. I think it's hard to see yourself on film. He was again. Uh, it was a reluctant. Um, you know, he didn't really want. I mean, he wasn't really that interested in film, and Jesse really had to go and say, "There's a. We'd really like to do this." It was independent. Um, whoever asked that question we did the film independently. Um, I don't know what his family really, I don't really know what his family thinks about it. So let me, let me jump in here for a moment and actually take us back to the history that our foundation uh, focuses on, which is of course, Holocaust remembrance. And there's um, so much, um, well, there's this myth that he was somehow a Nazi collaborator as a child of 13. And Michael Berenbaum, you are really the world's leading authority on the Holocaust. Can you just address this very specific uh, issue? Let me say, I don't believe that any child of 13, um, one was responsible for what happened in Budapest. Uh, number two, uh, I don't think that, uh, I think that the, we're reading back into, we're reading back into Soros a power that he certainly could not have had at that age. And also um, in the fact that uh, in the question of identifying people as Jews, the most that I understood is that he went along with someone who um, was, he, he was in the custody of uh, someone who had a, um, a record that was less than admirable but at the same time, the person had a, a record that was less than admirable. He also was saving a Jewish child. So we call that in our field, the gray zone, neither um, uh, in which the world is not necessarily black or white. Uh, it's clear about, two things are clear to me about Soros. Number one is that the Holocaust is a central part of his identity and a central part about what he sees doing in the world. And if you measure his career in one sense, 
you'd say the first part of his career was establishing his life. And the second part of his career was after he established his life with unbelievable um, wealth and achievement was making, doing something with his life, which is again, something that we've seen um, in survivors uh, all over the place. Let me ask Priscilla a question. If Soros were not a Jew, do you think that he would get the same um, response for the same deeds, for the same action? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking, I think he would get a different, yeah, he w- it would be a different response probably. I think that, you know, Nadine Epstein in the film talks about how uh, Lyndon LaRouche took up that trope. And um, I, first of all, Michael, the way that you contextualize his life, you know, I really appreciate that because um, yeah, he was a child growing up in the Holocaust and, and just seeing his entire, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed within a couple of weeks, which he tells us. This is not, you know, this is something I don't think, it, you know, and for many of you, your families, yourselves, I mean, it's just, it's just unimaginable how, what that does to a person. It's just unimaginable. Um, and so it's, I think it's so ironic. Um, I mean, it's the great irony is that, you know, he is really, you know, picked up, called a Nazi collaborator. And a lot of times it, it's, it just, it, it doesn't, it's sort of like hard to imagine, but I think that probably, can we name another, I think, you know, philanthropist on this level who's done this much, who is, who's also controversial, who's getting the same amount of hate. I think some of the, some of your uh, audience is asking that question, right? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I would say probably it is, uh, it's about a lot of it is anti-Semitism because it's, uh, it's a great um, foe. It's a great target. Can you talk for a moment about the network of universities abroad that he supports were being asked? You know, he funded a great university in Hungary um, and uh, it had to move. Uh, and so, you know, I think he, I think that, you know, he has a lot of pride in that university. Um, and that's, that's the, um, you know, uh, CEU. And uh, I think that's the main, the main university he's funded in Europe. Uh, and I think he's very proud of the work that it's done. And it is, a, it is an amazing institution, you know, bringing people on scholarship from around the world to learn, um, you know, to learn about, uh, you know, open society and what it means and just, you know, and there is some irony there. That's where Victor Orban went to school, um, which is, which, uh, you know, I think is something. What do, what do you think, Priscilla? Yeah, well, so from CEU, which is Central European University, from there, as, as you said, he had to, you know, leave. But now there is an organization, at CSUN, and if you go to the Open Society Foundations, you can read about it. And it's just bringing together um, uh, different universities um, and giving people, young people, the opportunity to work on a lot of policy, you know, almost like graduate work. So it's, and they're all bound together. It's still with the sort of similar values that were imparted um, at CEU. And I think that Bard also has a relationship, Bard College in New York uh, has a relationship with um, that whole project. I also think that, that um, it's crystal clear that George Soros is a, is a um, an intellectual philanthropic agent of globalization. And consequently, if you regard him as such, then one, and, and he's looking to appeal to those within the society, within the different societies, who are not only for an open society, but for a globally integrated open society, which means that when you're talking about the opponents of globalization, they ipso facto become the opponents of George Soros, who's an identifiable, identifiable figure in the struggle for, in the struggle between globalization and the like. So now you know, I'm take yeah. the floor back right now, uh, just briefly to tell you about upcoming programs. And then we're going to get to a few more of the audience questions. And then we will turn back to our speakers for their final thoughts. So next week, we're going to feature a 
really dramatic story about a ship uh, called the SS Kwanzaa. Now you may have heard the story of the ship, the St. Louis from 1939 that was turned back by the United States. And uh, many of the passengers when they were returned to Europe then ended up perishing in the Holocaust. It's a shameful episode of American history. But there was another ship the following year called the Kwanzaa that left the port of Lisbon in August of 1940, bound for New York and then for uh, Mexico. Uh, what happened in that case was that, um, well, that ship also was turned back, uh, but uh, there was uh, fortunately, the intervention of quite a few people, there were lawyers involved, uh, and um, the passengers uh, were doing all they could to make the story known by cabling from the ship to people that they knew. Anyway, the, the, the story of this ship uh, made uh, the newspapers and caught the attention of Eleanor Roosevelt, who then personally rescued the passengers on that ship, the Kwanzaa. So we're gonna show a film about that story called Nobody Wants Us. And we're gonna have the filmmaker, Laura Seltzer Dunai. We're gonna have Blanche Wiesen Cook, who's the world's expert on Eleanor Roosevelt. She's written her three volume biography and other speakers as well. So that is coming up next week. The week following, we have another very dramatic story, and that has to do with the rescue of the Jews of Bulgaria. Uh, in the country of Bulgaria, there were uh, just under 50,000 Jews, and every single one of them, the entire Jewish population of Bulgaria was saved. And that's another very amazing story. We have again, the filmmaker. We also have a woman who was herself in Bulgaria during those years, Dr. Alice Eichenbaum. Uh, and uh, so that's another story you won't wanna miss. That's a free program. Uh, and then in three weeks time, we have a film called Dear Freddie which focuses on a remarkable man named Freddie Hirsch, who was a Jewish youth leader. Uh, he um, was uh, from Germany, but he was a youth leader in Prague. And then he was arrested, sent to Theresienstadt, where he became a leader among the children at Theresienstadt. He ultimately was sent to Auschwitz, where he was um, he protected the children in his care uh, in a story that really is not known. Um, so it's quite, quite a remarkable story. We, we'll have Freddie Hirsch's niece to speak about her uncle. We will have uh, the filmmaker and uh, experts on the story. So right now we're just going to see a brief little trailer for that film, Dear Freddie. When we were uh, in Auschwitz, Freddy always made us feel like princes and princesses and king and queens. Freddy is a Romain. All the people are going to הוא היה נחמד, הוא ידע לדבר עם מנגלה. הוא היה בנוי יפה, איש יפה, חייכן, אהב ילדים. ידענו שבחורות רצות אחריו, וזה לא הלך. Beautiful, very sexy girls in Terezin. Just, you know, looking, will he fall for this one or the other one? Or is it hopeless? He couldn't fall in love. That was the gossip of the ghetto.
could. So after today's program, you will receive an email with more information about all three of those programs. And of course, I'm, I would encourage all of you to sign up and I hope you do. So now let's turn back to some of your questions and then we'll turn back to our speakers for their final thoughts. How can we find out more about Soros after the program without having to necessarily do a deep online search? Where would you suggest we go, Jesse and Priscilla? I would say, first of all, somebody has been putting in the chat. Um, if you want to know about the work, I would go to, I'm sorry to send you online, but do go to the Open Society Foundations um, where you can really read a lot more and that will send you um, to places. And they, there's a lot of content there. I um, mean, they'll show you where um, they work around the world. Um, but there's also a lot of books about George. Um, there's a recent one that has just come out. And I'm going to try to put the name of that in the chat for you all. Um, and he himself has written um, several books, which are really interesting. So I don't know if that helps. And Jesse, do you have any thoughts? No, I agree with that. I think the books he's written are pretty interesting. They could be a little dry, but you'll you'll get a uh, an even deeper sort of opinion about him and how he thinks about the world, which I think, you know, and I think that the lesson of George, you know, we, we had the question about, you know, um, uh, why a movie about George? And I think the answer is because we can all do stuff, you know, we can all do things and, and George sorts of shows us a way that we can do that and uh, find our own way in the world and, and, and sort of be a part of our own philanthropies, whether whatever we're going to do is much, much smaller, but still just as important. Now, how is George planning for um, continuity of his work after he's gone? And at night, you know, at ninety-one, I had a professor who was ninety-one and has said, at "My age, you don't buy green bananas." <laughs> um, I think that he's made the decision to keep the Open Society Foundations going. He just put a a large amount of money into it, and I think he hopes it continues as a foundation and stays committed to underserved populations around the world long after he's gone. Somebody suggested um, that a comparable sense of controversy would be the uh, Koch brothers. Um, uh, a non-Jewish non sense in terms of what they're, non-Jews in terms of what they're trying to build and trying to create and get I mean, that they, type of controversy. You know, I think they're, they're both, I, I think that Koch brothers do get a lot of controversy. I think they're looking for a very um, specific political uh, structure as to how to change lives. I think that George is looking to how do people express themselves around the world, which I think is a slightly different sort of intention. But yeah, as, as a profile, I think the Koch brothers are sort of comparable, but, but much smaller. Um, and and uh, George is, I think the the vitriol has grown in, on him uh, even more in recent years, you know? And I'd probably say much more limited in what they're trying to achieve and probably yeah. much, much more specific. Uh, let's and, ask, we're gonna ask a couple of very short questions uh, before, um, uh, before we wrap up. If you had to describe, we have a, 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 a listener who has not uh, clear about what do you believe the source and the root of the hatred is for George Soros? You know, um, again, I, I think that it, it's a couple of things, but I, I'm glad you brought up this idea of globalization uh, before. I don't know whether Jesse was on. I think that George is, uh, is definitely committed to um, people having the ability to move freely around the world. And I think that in and of itself, it feels very threatening to a lot of people, a lot of leaders, right? There's a lot of leaders that just want, want to, they're, they're holding on to nationalism, they're holding on to, um, you know, we have to keep ourselves separate. And I think some of the, the things that, that, he's, that he's interested in that the, the society um, fosters, open, you know, open dialogue, et cetera, is really a counterpoint with that idea. So I think that's, that's number one. And again, um, I think that he he has made it his business now um, to to push into places where he feels there is injustice, and he says it in the film that I, he is going to piss people off for doing that. He's going to take a stand, and he's said in his life, 
I'm going to stand for something and I'm willing to stake my life on it. And I think that that again is really a very threatening. Most of us, you know, how many of us really stand up and say what we believe in and, 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 and then put whatever resources we have behind it. So I think all of that is at some times counter to what other people believe the vision of the world is. The irony of course, is that in an open society, there should be discourse, but, and I know somebody wrote about hate speech in there, you know, what, what is, what is, what is, where does hate speech go um, when you're having an, an open dialogue? And so then, you know, you're getting into a very interesting, that is a great question that somebody put into the chat. And I think that that tips the line when you're inciting violence, then you're really, you know, then you're really impinging on other people's freedoms. But again, I think it's uh, taking positions that are not uh, always the popular ones within a society. So Michael, why don't you finish us off with, with whatever thought you would like to leave for our audience? I think we're dealing with a remarkable man who's trying to do something quite remarkable, who's willing to take the heat in, um, for what he's doing. And I think the film uh, presents a fair and um, um, an open consideration of who this man is and what he represents. Uh, I'm wondering um, in some way if there's not an interesting sequel to this, which is the interrelationship between his philanthropy and his money making. Well, it's a complicated, that's a complicated question. And I asked him about it quite a few times and, and uh, you know, he sees it all as one thing for sure, but it's, it's hard for the rest of us. You know, he would tell me stories about it. There's one in the film about uh, reading the newspaper on the chairlift. He bought, you know, uh, the, he bought the stock in, um, in uh, a car company at the top of the hill. I had no idea what he was talking about. You know, at the end of it, he says, you know what I mean? I was like, no, George, I have no idea what you mean. You know, so it's complicated. Well, that's that's why that's why you're a uh, you're a filmmaker and, uh, and and not a Wall Street broker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly. And for a hedge fund or a hedge fund manager, I think yeah. we've exhausted our time. Let me uh, just conclude also by saying, I have seen um, three of the films that are being recommended. They're not misses, and Freddie Hirsch in particular also raises the unexplored issue about um, relations between, um, about uh, his gayness uh, during the Holocaust and what that represented. And last word that Olivia unexpectedly, because she always does everything absolutely perfectly. The end of Freddie Hirsch was that he was asked um, to essentially abandon the children and lead the resistance because he had those characteristics uh, of a leader or be with the children to the end. And he grappled with that experience and it's unclear whether at that moment he committed suicide or he was killed by groups that did not want resistance to break out. So when you see the film, you'll consider the mystery and uh, I can't come to a conclusion from what I know. And I challenge any of you to come to a conclusion by what you learn. So back to you, Olivia. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob and thank uh, Jesse. And thank you very much, uh, Priscilla. We had a, a very interesting and very important conversation, a beginning, not an end. Yes, I thank feel you. like we basically, we, we barely scratched the surface of really a global story. I, I couldn't believe when I first watched the film, which I've now watched numerous times, uh, just how many stories it tells. It basically tells the history of the world. Mm. So it's quite a tour de force, this film, and I congratulate you and I thank you for letting us screen it. Uh, I, I also, of course, thank our three speakers for giving so generously of their time and to our audience who comes to our programs week after week Thank you again and see you soon. Bye-bye everybody, bye-bye.